Well, I'd like to read from Matthew's Gospel. This morning we've been looking at Matthew for the past several months here on our Sunday mornings at some of what I've called the radical teachings of Jesus, and there are a lot of them. This morning I'd like to read the resurrection account from Matthew 28, beginning with verse 1. And we want to look at one, one final radical teaching, if you will. In Matthew 28, I'm reading from the New International Version this morning. It says, After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. And there they did see him on several occasions, as Paul would later record. First he was seen by the apostles, and then Cephas, and then some of the others, and, and finally was seen by above 500 of the brothers at one time. And we are left with the record. Well, I want to back up a few days in this story. It was about 3 o'clock on a dark Friday afternoon. Jesus the Christ, fully God and fully man, hung on a Roman cross. And there in that moment, he said perhaps the most human thing he could possibly have said. Not, I'm thirsty, yes, he said that, and that perhaps is second most human of all his words from the cross. Not, Father, forgive them. That's not very human at all. To err is human, to forgive is divine, we're told. Not, as he said to the thief beside him, today you will be with me in paradise. That's not a very human thing to say. Not, woman, behold your son. That maybe comes in third place. Not into thy hands I commit my spirit. Not it is finished. I believe that the most human thing Jesus could possibly have said was the only thing Matthew chose to record him as saying. Those of you who were gathered here Friday evening, we talked about this. Echoing the cry of despair first penned by David in the opening stanza of Psalm 22 and repeated over the generations by millions who have felt isolated, forsaken, and forgotten in the midst of their suffering. Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? then, Jesus did the most human thing he could possibly have done. In one beautiful and horrible and loving and life-changing and world-changing and eternity-changing moment, he died. Jesus, the eternal word, who had become flesh, 
experienced firsthand human death. then on Sunday. Then on Sunday, Jesus demonstrated not his humanity, but his deity. Then on Sunday, Jesus demonstrated his God nature in perhaps the most powerful and beautiful and hope-filled and faith-inducing and life-transforming and story-changing way he possibly could. No, he didn't turn stones into bread. He didn't throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple so that angels would catch him. In a hidden corner of the universe he had created, the God who died walked out of the grave. And the first recorded teaching he gave was so powerful, so radical. And yet so simple that we so often overlook it in our rush to finish the story. I just read it. You remember? Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Matthew wrote that for us. We call Matthew's story, Matthew's book, one of the four Gospels. You know what the word Gospel means? The word Gospel means good news. And the good news of the crucified and risen Christ is centered in those words. Do not Jesus, the Son of God, Fully God, yet fully human, who had humbled himself, taking the form of a servant, become obedient to the point of laying down his life and willingly facing the greatest of human fears. Said to the women, out of both his, his God nature and his human experience, don't be afraid. Perhaps the most Relevant, comprehensive, understanding, compassionate, transforming words a creator could say to his creation. You don't have to be afraid. I want us to really hear those words this morning. It's a simple statement that has the power to change everything. What is it you fear this morning? Really? Maybe you can't look past today's dinner and say, I'm afraid I'm not going to have enough food for everybody. And we chuckle. What about the fear of not having enough food for your family, period? It's a real fear for some people. Not having a job. Maybe losing the job you have or not finding a job when you need it. Not having enough money for retirement. What do you fear this morning? Never being married. Being married but never having the relationship you hoped for. The loss of your marriage. Something happen, happening to one of your children. What do you fear this morning? Losing someone close to you. Being alone. Failing. And we've all been there and done that, haven't we? What do you fear this morning? Never been able, being able to move past your failures, my failures. What do you fear this morning? Ne never truly being forgiven. What do you fear this morning? 
sickness. Cancer. Dying. Death itself. I believe as both God and man, Jesus understood every one of those fears. In some form or another. And the God who died who walked out of the grave, said to the women, he says to us, he said to his disciples, you don't have to be afraid. Believe the demonstration of God's love for his creation through his son Jesus makes a difference in all those areas of life. It doesn't necessarily mean we won't face any or all of those in some form or another. But his presence, his promise, his demonstration of God's love for us make it possible to face our fears, make it possible for us to not have to be afraid. As we commit ourselves to following him, we commit ourselves to trusting him. We commit ourselves to receiving from him the gift he offers us, the eternal life he promises us, the presence in this life of one to guide us, to be with us, to to give us meaning and purpose in this life and hope beyond this life. The one who says, don't be afraid, invites us to come to him, invites us to trust in him, and then gives us a second word. Now go tell the good news.